Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rehash, a Web3 podcast. Today, we're speaking with Queen Wartooth, who is undoxed and anonymous. And that's why for anyone watching this on YouTube, you're seeing her PFP instead of her face. But she is joining us today to share for the first time about Dragon Academy, the project she's been building in stealth and will be launching in the next few weeks. Queen Wartooth has done a lot of work around designing airdrops and thinking about how best to incentivize users. And we spend the first half or so of the conversation talking about airdrop design, anti civil strategies, and problems around user acquisition in crypto in general. Then for the second half of the combo, Wartooth opens up about Dragon Academy, which aims to fundamentally change how airdrops are architected and executed to the benefit of both long-term aligned products and new users. I'm super stoked that Wartooth chose Rehash to be the first place to talk publicly about her new project. And I'm also really excited to be a user of Dragon Academy once they officially launch. If you have any questions for Wartooth after listening to this episode or want to chat with other listeners, make sure you join us on Telegram at t.me slash rehashweb3 and make sure you're following Study Dragons NFT on Twitter so you don't miss an update on Wartooth's new project. Queen Wartooth was nominated by Andy Boyan and voted onto the podcast by Hudson Jameson, Andy Boyan, Tim Black, and myself, Diana Chen. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Queen Wartooth. We have Queen Wartooth with us today. Welcome to Rehash. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. The whole voting process was exciting and I'm really just grateful to be here. And thanks so much for accommodating being a non. It is one of the tenets of crypto that I really love this kind of privacy as a human right. So I love seeing the chat too on this. It looks great to me. Awesome. Sounds good. We've got a bunch of people in the chat. I see that we have Andy Boyan in the chat. Thanks, Andy, for nominating Wartooth for the podcast and bringing her to our networks and to our knowledge. And Wartooth, I'm super excited about this episode. I was telling her earlier before this, but I'm really excited about this episode because, you know, we're Rehash isn't like a news outlet or anything like that. So we don't tend to get a lot of exclusives for people coming on Rehash and announcing a project for the first time or anything like that. But that's what we're getting today. Queen Wartooth has been building in stealth for a while, and she's going to be announcing her new project and telling us all about it for the first time on Rehash today. Good thing that you guys are all here because it's the first time that you're going to be getting to hear about it. And you'll also get to ask any questions you have for her live in the chat. So if you do think of any questions along the way, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat. And so feel free to throw it in the chat and we will try to get around to as many questions as we can. I am going to go ahead and start off with kind of a big topic that I think everybody is interested in and scared of at the same time, and that's token airdrops. So I think a lot of times when people in crypto think about building community, their mind immediately goes to launching a token, to doing airdrops. But as we all know, who've been in the space for a little bit, that's not always the most successful strategy when we're talking about retaining users for the long term. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective, what do you see as some of the biggest gaps between this so-called stated purpose of airdrops and the actual impact that they have? To look at that, like the biggest gaps between these, I think the stated purpose is definitely the most ideal. So at its best, of course, airdrops are fair token distributions and governance potentials. And they're either distributed for free, which kind of quickly increases engagement and all that stuff. And that's how things started with campaigns like Uniswap, airdrop and others. And then we sort of moved to this model of providing tokens as rewards, incentivizing users kind of to engage with the platform or do certain actions or now it's even kind of social media tasks and and all that. And we still have the ideals of governance and fair token distribution, but it's kind of just become sort of a race for the exits. And that leads me into the actual impacts there. The purpose of it being really, really great has a significant gap with what's actually occurring. And that's just because of human nature. Every airdrop that I can think of, Uniswap, Oneage, all all of those have suffered because the recipients sell their tokens. You know, it, it causes price volatility. It causes speculative trading where people know that the business model here is it's going to go up and then it's going to go down. And so you need to get in and get out. And that means that airdrops as an incentive mechanism have just become attracting speculators who are only interested in profits. And this can range from outright civil attackers who are faking engagement and faking interaction to just get 
large amounts of supply to dump to team exits to farmers and mercenary users who maybe they're not Sybil attackers, but they're really just there to dump the token once they get it. And as a result, we're not getting tokens anymore. You know, now we get points or vibes or XP or whatever it is. And users are performing these tasks, holding the opportunity costs for just ultimately no return. So the incentives and the great like, purpose of these airdrops, which started really noble and ideal, have sort of devolved into this sort of situation we have now with the actual impact, which is just like it's a casino and casinos are fun there's a use case for that yeah absolutely so what do you think has caused this move from the stated purpose of airdrops which is really noble and good to what the impact that they've actually been having I think it's just the fact that tokens here are being airdropped to people who then have done a lot of work or have held a lot of risk or missed a lot of opportunities who are now incentivized, you know, personally to sell these tokens that they've gotten for being VCs or KOLs or even just early buyers, early users. They're incentivized after the token goes up in value to cut it off, to make their money and move on to something else. And that's the problem, I think, with not only just airdrops, but sort of the products in general that we're seeing with crypto that are almost now only being funded by airdrops, by this promise of points or this promise of like, hey, maybe our platform is really rickety and stuff, but hey, we're going to have you know an airdrop coming soon. And that keeps people coming back because it's a gamble. It's speculation on speculation. Yeah. A, a, a question too that Meg had for you on Twitter that I thought was interesting is she said, are airdrops a better user acquisition or retention tool? And I think the way that you've been talking about them so far, it sounds like, you know, we're talking about airdrops as more of a retention tool. But at least recently with this new wave, I've been getting a lot of airdrops for new projects that haven't launched yet. I, you know, I don't even know how I got on the allow list and I have no idea what these projects are. And so it almost seems like people are starting to use airdrops as a user acquisition tool more and more now as well. How do you see that? I definitely agree with you. I think that it's being used as both. And so whether or not one's better than the other, of like, is it better for acquisition or retention? It's money. You know, as long as you have an annual marketing budget, you can include airdrops as an incentive mechanism. And whatever incentive or whatever behavior that you're incentivizing there, it's just a tool. If the product has a way to generate value and if it was created to be a long term product, then you can use these airdrops to reward users for staying loyal to you and, and, you know, using the product genuinely, authentically. Or you can use it like you're describing to airdrop kind of in the initial way the airdrop started is just distributing these tokens to sort of increase interest amongst users that don't know anything about your product. You just see it in your wallet, right? Or you've been using this product and now it's like, wait, what are these tokens for? But for the most part, yeah, they just they just get dumped. How do we then, if, you know, assuming we are talking about a project that is trying to build for the long term, how do we incentivize these users beyond that initial excitement of receiving an airdrop and making some money and then dumping it immediately? How do we actually incentivize them to stick around when, there do, does seem to be these diminishing returns. So I think you need to do as a as a project, as a DeFi or, or any kind of crypto project, you need to do two things, and that's generate value, make money. You need to be able to make money and then drive that value back to your holders. The people who are holding your token or using your product, they need to be able to make money and they need to be able to do that continuously or your product is simply something to speculate on that they think it's going to go up and down. And that we see that in traditional markets, right, where if something you know has a speculative or a tech use case, it's valued differently than something that is a business. And I think as crypto is sort of, sort of maturing into this consumer crypto app ecosystem, we people need to have the ability to make money or have some kind of fun experience, you know, that they keep coming back for. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So as a follow up to that, then this is also a question. So that was a question from Andy Boy, and this is a follow up from him is how do, how do community builders then create communities that love each other and want to carry it forward regardless of the price of that token? Well, so first and foremost, and this is something that I have seen overlooked several times and kill just beautiful projects, is you have to make the community safe. There's no community that can love each other and, and be cohesive and work towards a goal when they feel unsafe. So making sure that like your Discord is set up well, your website is set up well, your smart contracts are set up well, do your due diligence to make the community safer for people. And, and that way they sort of feel that support from underneath that this is a structured place where they're not going to get like rugged or harassed or, or click a link and get their wallet drained or something. 
Another way, I think, is making sure that you post a lot of wins and you make sure that your community celebrates as a community of seeing these like, oh, I made this money or I did this today or I've accomplished this with the protocol. I've found this new use case for it and celebrating those, you know, an individual posting in Discord to like a few reacts. Can you also share some tangible examples or lessons you've learned for how to create as a community leader? How do you create a community that does feel safe to people? Because I think that's a big problem in crypto in general is that a lot of people don't feel safe. You know, like a lot of a lot of people on crypto Twitter are not the kindest. You know, people are kind of there just to argue. And same thing in the discords, too, just because they're smaller, more private communities doesn't mean that the, you know, the, the fighting and the hate and the harmful words goes away just because, you know, you're in more of a smaller community. I think you just have good moderation, really good people that are there all the time that kind of can call that stuff out and say, hey, you know, this is not the place for that. Like, this is a different kind of place and establishing yourself as like a business and not like a, a personal community or a community of just pals and just friends, which I think we saw a lot in like 2020 and 2021, which is fun. But then when, so, when stuff bad happens or you found out your friend bought a house and, and all your money's gone, like that, that deteriorates quickly. So being a business and communicating or knowing when to communicate as like a brand and to set things up like a brand and do the diligence of a brand versus communicating in the smaller sort of fractal of the, uh, the discussions as a person and as a voice and as a human of like, hey, this is a pretty garden that we've made here. Like stop throwing trash on the ground and making sure that it's it is a pretty garden, you know. Yeah, I think, you know, establishing the ground rules and bringing in the right people into your community from day one to help set the tone for the community is is really important and can have really big long term returns. I do think that is a big problem we see in crypto in general, though, is people building with their friends and for their friends. And I think that's kind of like the, you know, the, what, what we're seeing a lot of people complain about with consumer apps in crypto not really actually addressing consumers is that we tend to have this habit of building for our friends and building for solving the problems that our friends have our friends who are already deeply embedded in the space which is not reflective of the mainstream at all so it, it is a challenging thing to get out of whether we're talking about you know building a product or building a community or anything like that but i i do definitely agree that that's a really important facet yeah, well said. And look what's happened is we've kind of built all these highways and all these strip malls, but nothing to do. There's just like infrastructure and tooling. And basically you can gamble or you can take advantage of banking services. And, you know, gambling's fun while you're winning and while things are good and, and the money is turned on. Once the big players have decided to exit and it's no longer the time to gamble, it's really not fun. And there you see sort of the aftermath of what happens with all these influencers who were once like heroes, you know, and, and really held up on pedestals are now just hated. And, you know, well, here he goes again talking about his his terrible coin. And you watch how the community that you built sort of falls apart and turns on you simply because it was only there to make money. That's a really good analogy that we sort of built like the highways and the roads and the strip malls, but nothing to fill it with. And so people aren't coming. Do you think, though, like following on that analogy that we're actually set we've set ourselves up for success moving forward if we can put the right things into those buildings by, you know, designing the infrastructure first versus, you know, if you were to think about building the opposite way where we build all of these cool things that we want to put in stores, but there's no stores to put it in. There's no roads connecting people to these stores. People can't get there. Do you think that following on that analogy that we're actually like, would you say that you're bullish with the way that we've sort of built the infra and then the consumer apps are coming? Or do you think it's a more problematic than that? No, I'm 100 percent bullish. I think that we, you know, maybe we didn't know the way when we were beginning about this, but look how perfect it's turning out that, yeah, we built things from the blockchain level and then to the DAOs. And then, you know, as we've moved on and matured and things have gotten to this point where people are like, oh, our meme coins and and gambling mania and stuff is like, wait, this is it. Like Now we finally have all of the tech beneath us, all of the ideas, all of the stuff that we've kind of, and even regulators coming aboard and saying, okay, this is pretty cool. 
But now, you know, we have to decide what we're going to allow in in all this beautiful like city that we've built around these big, you know, protocols and chains and and beautiful use cases of blockchain. Just what people can do with this cool technology once they understand it and they're onboarded to it. And it's not just our friends. It is new people coming in and saying, hey, wait, what if we did this and and building stuff to do here? Yeah. So going back to something you said earlier about Sybil, that has obviously been a really big problem with tokens and airdrops in particular. Have you found any way to combat this Sybil problem and prevent Sybil attacks? Well, in theory, but I've designed a few airdrop campaigns before. I've done several of them now and it's difficult. But I think the strategies that I've used that have been effective is just giving Sybil attackers a way to contribute and be compensated for that without putting sell pressure on the token. So compensating their contributions through third party services like Galaxy or even like Gitcoin or or any of the rabbit task, any of those things that you can use to compensate people for this automated behavior that we don't necessarily not want. Like if there's an AI protocol, they probably don't care if the behavior is automated. The problem is that the behavior of civil attackers are to put sell pressure on the token as soon as they get it. So I think just making sure they don't have access to that token. They can have access to a different type of reward, um, whatever the major is on the chain you are or whatever stable that you feel comfortable. Make it part of a budget as opposed to just gambling the supply of your token to people who you know are planning to just get rid of it as fast as they can for the liquidity underneath. So giving them a way to just, okay, here's your way to make money. Here's your, your path here and even making it fun for them. And then making the opportunities to earn human-gated rewards validated by humans. And then too slow and too costly time-wise to make sense economically for someone that's just trying to make, you know, a return on tokens or, or get tokens to farm them. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of, I, I think it's really interesting that you like brought up airdrop design and how you've designed different airdrop campaigns. When we think about like structuring airdrops, I'd love to hear more from your experience, your research, what you've learned about how we can restructure these airdrops to be more effective. And so like most of what I've seen, obviously there's a variety of different airdrop structures already, but a lot of what I've been seeing recently is kind of what I brought up earlier with, you know, I just, I go on daylight, daylight.xyz, I connect my wallet, I see what airdrops I qualify for. And half of those projects I've never even heard of before, but yet I still go and I claim my airdrop. And sometimes it turns out to be quite a bit of money. And, you know, maybe then I'll be like, okay, well, I wonder what this project actually is that's giving me hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars when I don't even know what they are. You know, then that piques my curiosity. But I'd love to hear more from you about how you would recommend like restructuring airdrops for them to be more effective long term. So that experience you're describing is exactly like the beautiful use case of an airdrop. You're excited. Like, oh my gosh, this is worth this much. And maybe when you first got airdropped, it wasn't worth very much and you didn't notice, but it is now. You've made money. Making money was the experience that brought you, you know, to that page in the first place. So someone gave you that experience, but what they rewarded was just you coming and claiming the airdrop or you looking at the project and maybe interacting. So I think if we take that airdrop money that for right now is sort of being just sprayed with a hope of like that it, it hits some users that will use the product, we use airdrops as they were intended. And that's to reward early supporters and adopters and get users to share in the value that has been created by the product and not have it just be, go to a certain number of insiders or a certain number of investors, but have this, you know, distribution of the value go to the same people that you want to use your product, make them loyal, give them the experience that they want, which is, hey, look at my wallet. Oh my gosh, I can pay the light bill or I can put a down payment on a house or I don't have to worry about rent. Like I was so stressed. That kind of stuff makes people come and makes them feel like a part of the community and the, you know, the excitement of it. So I guess part of the equation there then is also finding the right people to airdrop to. So do you, what advice do you have to projects for finding the right people who have the highest chance of actually being excited about the project and using it? So I would say, again, rewarding behavior. This is kind of the, the going to segue into why we're building what we're building, but finding a way to, to reward someone's reputation 
what do they do with the tokens? What do they do when they get them? What has been that historical kind of occurrence on chain? Are these people that hold a lot of NFTs? Are these people that have held a wallet since, you know, 2019? Or is this a wallet that was created four days ago and has never had more than $400 in it for gas? But when we draw conclusions from it, we can see, oh, this is a user that is authentically engaged with your protocol. Maybe they don't quite know how to use it, or maybe they didn't understand, or it wasn't a good fit, but they are here in the system authentically. And look at that. We can actually prove, you know, looking on chain and looking at off chain events, that this person has been involved with your product from the beginning. They would be a perfect recipient for a token. They use your product anyway. And that person is less likely to put sell pressure on your token because they're engaged, they are educated, and really, I don't think you can ask much more than that from a user. Yeah, so let's then segue into what you've been building for in stealth that you're going to share for the first time today, because a lot of that, that'll answer a lot of our questions about how do we solve a lot of the problems that we've identified so far. So if people in the audience have, you know, saw the Luma invites, maybe they noticed already that the project you've been working on is called Dragon Academy. Tell us all about what Dragon Academy is. Dragon Academy is in the simplest, most like, you know, editorialized way. It's an onboarding platform. And what we're aiming to do is solve this airdrop problem and kind of change the way that we architect airdrops and that we look at airdrops as a mechanism. Dragon Academy is going to be a, a simple website based, very cozy, very familiar and frictionless experience for users that's token gated by an NFT, which is a very familiar, again, experience for, for retail. So we've got this we've got this academy that delivers an onboarding experience and at the same time sort of empowers retail users by doing these skills and tasks like I'm sure you've seen with you know Gitcoin and and Galaxy and stuff um but aggregates all of those things. So for non-technical people this would kind of be their Gitcoin, you know, and at the same time that they are doing these tasks and earning reputation and you know, completing all this interactive gamified stuff and doing on-chain, they are earning the projects token, they're earning USDC from us. And so instead of these protocols spraying airdrop money, hoping it hits users, we will train users for you. We will onboard them for you. We will use your tokens however you think they ought to be used to contribute the most beautifully to the ecosystem and we will then show people what we have done with that token by letting them kind of, you know, I'd say pretend, but through our UI, go through and see that, you know, you don't dump this token, you take it, you stake it, you take it to the other partners of the ecosystem, you vote with it. Like, and as these, these people are being paid small amounts of USDC to complete these tasks, the token is being held by a party, uh, which is us, who is behaving in bullish ways and behaving in long-term aligned value, valuable ways for the token itself. The users are being compensated for their work. They're also building reputation, building valuable skills, being able to maybe even get jobs and stuff as they, as they learn more and more things to do in the ecosystem. And this gives them just a very, very easy way to go from, I don't know anything about crypto, or maybe I have the Phantom app and I've gotten burned a few times to now I'm getting paid. This is a fun experience to come earn, you know, some money per day. And then being able to see all of these partner products and all of these skills and opportunities in crypto and just, you know, get their imaginations open. Compared to most of my friends in Web3, I'm not the most online person. And with how fast things move in this space, it can be really challenging to keep up with the newest projects and what's trending. That's why I love Forage, a community curated front page for launches shaping on-chain culture. A Forage launch page combines a press release and a commemorative mint into a sleek single page where they garner support in the form of mint. Projects receiving more mints are bumped to the top of the page, which means I can finally stop doom scrolling or worrying about missing an important launch and simply check Forage to stay up to date on what's happening on chain. And as an added bonus, Forage uses protocol rewards so supporters receive a referral reward each time someone mints through the referral link. Go to forage.xyz to get started today. Yeah, it almost reminds me of like the little tasks and rewards that you can do on Coinbase, which I know have been really helpful for onboarding people. But this is almost like like the whole platform is dedicated towards this, which I think is really cool. DeFi Beats has a really good question in the chat. He says, love this idea. What are your thoughts on proof of humanity? How does it play into your project? So I absolutely think that this is going to be a huge narrative next year. And that's who we want to give these airdrop, the bulk of these rewards to. 
as humans. We want human users to, you know, earn these rewards and be involved and be a part of the governance and stuff. So the proof of humanity there is essential, and that is going to become more and more valuable over time. I believe it's just my personal kind of opinion that the best way that we have in crypto to prove anything is by validation from other players, which means that another human will validate you as a human. Um, and they can do that through our academy by working together on these little merit-based tasks that are, you know, simple, easy something that you would get like a user feedback. You spend an hour with a representative from the protocol or one of us uh, on the team learning about a program, giving your feedback. And at the end of it, you're given feedback by the protocol. And in that moment there, we have one instance of like a little tick of, oh, that, that could be a human. That's a human thing to do there, to interact there and to do something. And we build up these little ticks and these pieces of data until we have enough to say, yep, we are valid that this is a, a person and we are so sure of it that we're going to mark them down in the system as human. Because um, at that point, even if they are AI or something cool, like they're doing such great things, honestly, we should we should have more things like that. Like, great. The behavior is good. I'm wondering how scalable that is if that verification process requires, you know, the user sending some sort of feedback back to the protocol. Is that it's something that is going to be scalable or is that like they like you need to build up such a big team that there are enough people to verify verbally or whatever the verification method is? So the cool thing with this is and I've built this before in like Galaxy campaigns is that as you scale the tasks, you can make another task pretty easily validating the tasks. And then that becomes something that they also earn USDC for. And after you complete 10 tasks, you can unlock the ability to validate others' ability to do the task. And the scaling of this is slow. It's definitely going to be something where we start with five or six partners with a, an education and curriculum system and a bounty system and this kind of hybrid tri-value reputation building experience for users and let it run for one year. We've got enrollment years and stuff and a kind of a plan for scaling where every year as we onboard new users and onboard new products and stuff to the collection, we then want to expand it, expand the team, expand the collection itself of the NFTs, and then expand our base of tasks and education and our kind of library of resources there every year. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, too, that this could be a good way for people to learn about crypto, learn about certain protocols and almost build up their resume that might help them do things in the future, like get jobs, for example. Can you give some examples of the types of tasks that you see being hosted on Dragon Academy? Is there going to be a set curriculum or is it like any project can approach you guys and say, hey, we have an idea for this task we'd like to run. And it, it, it kind of just depends on which projects approach you and what tasks they want to run. So the tasks in general, to answer your first question, we have educational tasks, which is something we're building. It's a curriculum and you see their videos, it's interactive tasks uh, through our website UI, or it's some sort of educational, um, maybe face-to-face -face in the Discord, something to help you learn. And that, that's one set of tasks. The reputation building tasks we have are off-chain, and those are things like aggregating all of the social media opportunities, aggregating all of the campaigns that are out there. And making sure that if you do finish them, you get something like we'll give you some USDC for doing that and some reputation for just doing the task and kind of, you know, that doesn't prove you're human, but it proves you're a bullish actor. Um, and then experiential tasks, which I'm most excited about. This is going to be the kind that are like small design requests, small memes, small telegram things, stickers to begin with. Um, even like we can grow this out to onboarding operating managers, onboarding devs, onboarding anything that we can teach and we can verify, we can create remote work for, and we can create a task-based system that's unlocked as you learn and experience and do these things and kind of earn your way into doing more complicated bounties sort of how farcaster works yeah can you describe that reputation building piece a little further so if i for example sign up to the platform and i start completing all of these educational tasks maybe some off-chain social media tasks how will that be reflected in my profile so that will be reflected by a level of your dragon and some visual changes at certain levels for the tech behind it like the blockchain part of it 
we're doing this with tokens. And these tokens are not tradable. They're sold down. They have zero financial incentive. But what they do is act as proof. And those tokens are distributed to the wallet that holds your NFT, which is once you enroll it in the academy, soul bound to that wallet. And so for completing these educational tasks, you're given learning tokens. For completing these reputation tasks, you're given reputation tokens. And these vary in amounts with the partner protocols. So if a partner protocol, for instance, wants to take advantage of making a, an onboarding system for them and how to onboard to our protocol, and it pays nine US dollars and gives you 60 reputation tokens and 50 learning tokens, that task now becomes proof that you did it because it happened on the blockchain, because you completed the task and it was validated by others. Now your wallet holds a record and we take advantage of the immutability of the blockchain where you're not trusting Queen Wardsuit and Dragon Academy, you can see that that happened, you know, on May 22nd, that you went in and you completed 18 tasks and you earned this money and you earned these experience tokens, you earn these reputation tokens, learning tokens. And over time, that contributes to something easy to understand, which is just a level. And something we haven't discussed yet that I'm trying really hard not to hint too much at, please, if we've got a white paper coming out, it's going to be so cool. But Leveling up your dragon is going to give you access to a very exciting experience in crypto and an experience that I feel will build that loyalty and give you the experience that people had in 2020 who did use Uniswap, who did use all of these beautiful use cases of airdrops. We're doing our part. Like this part of the community is going to behave bullishly because that's the way the rails are designed. And so I do believe that we're going to create this this kind of signal to protocols that we're great, great recipients for your air trucks. And again, there's there's more information in the white paper, but earning these tokens, specifically getting to level 10, getting to level 100 by Christmas Day, will offer and unlock an experience that many people in crypto probably cite as their reason for being here, staying. Are you able to share what that is? It's rewards. Come on. It's rewards. Got rewards. <laughs> yeah, it's rewards. So uh, as far as getting, you've got your USD thing that you get, and that's very steady. That's very easy. We've got a lot of people who, instead of, you know, spending $200,000 on an airdrop or the equivalent in their token, they simply make it a marketing cost or a grant for education expenses. So our users know, well, I can make, you know, $22 learning this. But what And so the use case of the economy then is not speculative for them. They're trading labor for, for USD. But what the reward system does is lets us interact with these partners and interact with these people and tell them, hey, guys, like these are some great people to airdrop to. And if we create a big enough wave of excitement and passion and, oh, my God, it's Christmas morning and my airdrop is X dollars, mom, wake up they will keep coming back. And the next year they're going to bring their friends. And the next year they're going to tell like, yeah, I I actually made like almost, you know, X dollars with this NFT. And it's not going to be just, oh, it was lucky and it was gambling. It's like, no, I earned this and now I have work. I just work at home now. Like many of us have have taken advantage of. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, along the lines of sort of this bullishness, Andy had a question in the chat. He said, 100,000 maybe fake users might let me raise another round, while 500 real for sure users might not. Part of this feels antithetical to the funding industry. Are you worried about the broader up only mindset of the industry? Uh, Big time. Yeah, that is true of, okay, do people even want, you know, authentic users that use the platform or do they just want to be able to raise? And the good news is, or good or bad, depending on how you look at it, is we do have a mechanism in place that level one and unenrolled NFTs can still qualify for automated tasks. So partners that work with us that don't care if it's going to be faked by, you know, 18 users with 50,000 wallets, as long as the volume is there. They have the opportunity to be transparent with us about that and make sure that the incentive mechanism matches what they're trying to actually do. Like if they don't really want users, if they really just want a bunch of bots and stuff, great. We can design something for that so that the appropriate user is taking advantage of the use case of the product. People probably aren't buying this NFT to not participate when they do enroll it. So I anticipate that we are going to have more people of the 10,000 of the total collection that 
do participate to get the rewards. And every year that'll grow. So we are, you know, the first year we may bring 8,000 users, but the next year we may bring 18. The next year after that, we may bring 40 and, you know, it's it'll scale. Can you explain that NFT structure a little bit more? So to begin with, we are going to incentivize very basic tasks like user testing, user feedback, completion of all the available existing opportunities with, you know, a certain partner protocol. Education, reputation and experiential tasks like we talked about before that grant you those tokens and USDC will all kind of be designed in this curriculum to take the user from knowing nothing, maybe kind of just knowing how to get NFTs and onto a chain to meaningfully engaging with protocols and learning actual like skills, things that are useful to Web3. The NFT keeps track of your level by keeping track of those tokens. And as a certain token level is reached, the metadata updates at certain levels. That talks with our website. Our website talks with our Discord. And so it's sort of very Web2 rails on this, which is why we are, by the way, chain completely agnostic. You can mint right now on any EVM chain and we are working on getting support for other chains. But yeah, anything you got, come on. And this website and this database is able to just see, well, they've got an NFT matching one of the ones that, that we have whitelisted and cleared for coming to access it. Cumbridge to other places and keeping your NFT there, leveling it up, keeping it in your wallet is going to be great for this first year, right? This 2024 class of 2024, year of the dragon. But after that, our plan is to update the UI, update the artwork, another, I don't know if it would be egg this time, but airdrop another NFT for the following year to any current holders that want to continue and then additionally grow the collection by 10,000. So, you know, class of 24, 2024 might be year of the dragon. Class of 2025 might be something completely different. You know, we might go out on a space theme or something, but that's going to allow people to engage with new content as we get new partners, keep their reputations in their NFT, and then also get access to, you know, very differentiated, very easy to understand later historical records of here's what I did in 2024. Here's what I did in 2025 and so on. Right. Yeah. No, I love that. Especially I feel like especially in the space, there are I feel like the way that people operate in crypto that I've seen is like a lot of people will go and, you know, get a job in crypto, work really hard at it for six to 12 to maybe 18 months and get super burnt out and then just take some time off and then redo the cycle. Right. And so like, in the traditional space, it's like we everybody talks about not having gaps on your resume because it reflects poorly. And so with things like Dragon Academy, people can actually still be keeping up their quote unquote resume and showing that they're doing things on, on chain and engaging on chain and engaging with protocols and keeping up with what new protocols are coming out, what new projects are coming out while still taking time off, you know, or maybe maybe like they're not full time for a little bit, they're doing like contract work or something like that learning that continuous opportunity to prove that you are always learning and that you are always participating, even when you don't have, you know, a full time job on your resume. I think that that's a pretty cool thing. Thank you so much. That's actually what I am most excited about in building this. 10% of our Mint is going to a organization called Dio, which is still us. We're just kind of forming a nonprofit. But we're turning this part after we have some data and, and how this stuff works into Dio, which is a decentralized income opportunity and making it so that, yeah, your your traditional resume doesn't really work in, in crypto because it is so sporadic and so like hey, if I was a hired marketing gun for three years and I worked with 18 protocols, it looks like I had 18 jobs in three years, but I didn't. I had this client, this client, this client, and these you know, events that have shaped my experience don't really track the same as they do in traditional finance. And it's just too hard to verify anything because who's to say what you did if your you know, efforts helped at all, if you did marketing at all, if you really did help with the PR. And so this is just on-chain a way to earn money and also a way to keep track of that for potential employers or partners of our protocol to see like, well, I can gate this by experience or I can gate this by historical, you know, activity on chain and make sure that whoever is working and doing these task based roles for me are trusted because of their merit and not necessarily their identity. So how do you plan to get people started on Dragon Academy? Are you going to enable people to, do people have to, you know, buy an egg NFT in order to get started? Or are you going to be airdropping people? I mean, speaking of airdropping, like what's your plan to get started? 
Yep. So eggs, we'll start to mint those. I think this summer we're coming out, I think June, mid-June. Just keep an eye out. Follow us on Twitter, by the way. We're, that's the best place to get any updates for this. But yeah, our eggs are going to be minted and capped at 10,000. There's no limit to how many eggs you can mint. And while the Academy is under construction and we're sort of finishing building out this, this website interface, the dragons are going to hatch. And I'm so excited. I can't say a word about it, but I am so excited to reveal the artwork. And from there, you've got a few options. You could enroll your dragon. If you love the one that you got, great, enroll it. And you start being able to access content, access you know the UI and sort of get your hand held through what this experience is going to look like. If you don't like your dragon very much, or maybe you want a different color, or you, you know, different starting chain, you can list it. You can list it on the same third-party marketplace wherever you have minted on whatever chain. There will be a place for that collection to be. Just go ahead and switch it up. You can also gift your dragon via digital delivery. We'll have an option for that that I'm excited about. Onboard your friends and relatives to crypto with a really fun experience this year. It's the year of the dragon, man. This is going to be awesome. So send them in this NFT via an access code and they make a great gift. And then we've also partnered to have a physical delivery. So you can onboard your friends and relatives here with this NFT, but you can have a physical gift card that represents their NFT and access to this and save it for Christmas or birthday, senior. I was thinking when you said physical, I was thinking of like, you know how like Pudgy Penguins has been making the physical like plushy toys. I was thinking if each dragon was attached to like its own individual physical plushie or something, that would be super awesome. But obviously also like a super big task <laughs> to make 10,000 like unique plushies. So yeah, but no, that's, that is super cool. I, I had a question for you as you were talking about that. Is your reputation based on the tasks that you, you complete and stuff once the platform gets going? Is your reputation tied to your dragon or is it tied to something else? Because I'm just thinking like if somebody completes, you know, somebody gets an egg mint, they get their dragon, they go six months, they complete all of these tasks on chain, off chain, whatever, and they build up this reputation and then they sell their dragon to somebody else who maybe like has never engaged in crypto before that the reputation carry over with the dragon or, or how does that work? So you cannot sell your dragon once you've started leveling it up. You can keep your dragon unenrolled in the academy. It's just a dragon flying around. It's just, you know, unenrolled. And that gives you the access to that retroactive rewards, civil friendly rewards, level one rewards. And also just, you know, if you want to sell it six months later to other people that maybe want an opportunity to join the academy, you can. But once you enroll them, the NFT becomes soul bound. And technically, yes, the the dragon is what's being tracked and and that contract, the smart contract that actually powers this is keeping a running total of these tokens that you've been given for USDC, proof of reputation, proof of humanity, you know, proof of experience. All these tokens together are used in an equation to come up with your level, which is just an easy numerical way to say, hey, this person has been here, you know, and they've got about four experience that's made up of all these points. Gotcha. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. The the locking of the NFT once you start completing the tasks. Are, do you have, is there anything else you want people to know about Dragon Academy that we haven't covered? Basically just check us out. Yeah, I think it's Study Dragons NFT on Twitter. We have studydragons.com. If you want to check us out there, I think by the time this airs, yeah, we should have website up and going. I'm really excited for people to just read through our docs. Let me know any feedback you have. We're going to have Twitter open, Discord open for anything. And then, yeah, we're just excited to get started building. And probably around this summer, you should take a look out and see if you would like to come in Mint. We've got the Mint open for users and the Mint open for protocols as well who are interested in taking advantage of this. And is there a way on the website where people can like enter their email so that they get notified when it launches or something like that? Or should people just keep an eye on the Twitter? Just the Twitter right now. That's going to be our best direct line of communication. Perfect. You guys have over 10,000 followers already, which is incredible for having been building in stealth. Like no one even knew what this was. How did you how did you get so many people hyped about this before announcing anything? So we have started a very slow burn marketing campaign back in Dubai and had kind of released at that point. We were baby Dragon Academy. We wanted to do kind of a cute leveling thing. And now we've grown up and we're very, very serious now of Dragon Academy. But we started there. We're also taking advantage of some non-CTE pipelines like Twitch and YouTube and even physical cinema ads, which I'm really excited about. If you're in Austin, Texas, go see a movie. You'll see us coming out. But that has led to people, yeah, coming to our Twitter. Unfortunately, our website's not quite up yet. So it's like, well, 
Thank you so much for the visit. But people are excited. I think users in retail want to understand crypto. They want to make money too. They want to be that guy in their friend group and and have the opportunities that everyone in, in Twitter has sort of taken for granted. Even just having an extra $500 a week, how, how much of a difference and relief that can make to people. They're hyped. So I'm really excited to deliver something that is going to give an experience that people love. Yeah, I think it's awesome that you guys have moved past crypto Twitter and gone to like platforms like Twitch and YouTube and even more traditional routes like movie ads. Because again, like if our goal is to onboard the next billion or whatever people talk about all the time, you know, like we we can't do that by staying in our crypto Twitter bubble and continuing to build for our friends. We got to break out of that. So I think that's awesome that you guys are going that route. So last question I ask every guest on the podcast this season is to give me a can you not? And so this is something that you know, you want to say, can you not do this? Like something that is a pet peeve of yours or something that, you know, is just annoying to you and you want people to stop doing. So do you, have you come prepared with a can you not for us today? I have 60. How much stuff? How much my top one? Hear, let's go. <laughs> Are you not be greedy? Can you not be greedy? At some point, we have to make a legitimate business. We have to deliver value. And so many beautiful products have failed because the team and the investors did everything in their power to extract the value for themselves, leave the community holding a worthless bag and and leaving. Remember your users. Remember these people. Like, would you pitch your own product to your mom? Would you pitch it to your sister to to use and to to take advantage of? Just don't be greedy. Build well. Yeah, that's such a key one. And it just it sucks because I think people have seen other people do that and get away with it. Sure. And so they're like, well, if I can do a get rich quick scheme, you know, who who cares? And everybody on the internet is anonymous or, you know, like it, it, even if they're not anonymous, like I don't know who they are. And so I don't care about potentially hurting them or whatever. But yeah, think about, you know, would you, would you, would you ask, tell your mom to, you know, use this fake product that you're building or your sister, or your family, somebody you care about? If not, then rethink that. No, it's a great one. Do you have another one? I'd love to hear another one. Can you not be sloppy with your freaking security? Put the 2FA on your Twitter. Get somebody good to build your Discord. Use the Come on. Like, this is kind of silly stuff that really, really it even makes our own government here in the U.S. kind of look a little silly sometimes that, OK, let's not be greedy. Let's not be lazy. People will come to this industry and be serious about it. And they are going to clean up because operationally, They've got their shit together. It's, it's this is too sloppy right now. We just need to tighten everything. And yeah, be a good actor, be a good neighbor, be a good participant. And that's the entire premise of, of what we're teaching our users. Be a good participant. That onus is on not just the individual user, but also on projects. I think a lot of people enter the space and engage with some projects, assuming that the builders of the project have gone to like massive lengths to ensure security. And so when the protocol is in insecure or the product is insecure and people get rugged because of that, like that to me is like so much worse than you not having good individual security and like getting rugs yourself. It's a concha. And that secure, when I was talking earlier about how do we build and foster true community, them feeling safe is paramount and feeling like, OK, somebody did care about how this was set up. Intention was taken to protect me because my money's here. And we expect that in every industry except this one. Yeah, no, 100%. Cool. Well, thank you so much for having fun with that and for share, coming on here and sharing about your new project, Dragon Academy. Everybody go follow. It's Study Dragons NFT on Twitter. That is going to be where you can keep up with everything. We'll include that in the show notes as well. And then tell people, too, if they want to follow you personally, where they can go to do that. Absolutely. I'm at Queen Wartooth on Twitter. Perfect. At Queen Wartooth at Study Dragons NFT. Thank you so much, Wartooth, for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for choosing Rehash to drop all this alpha and share your project with us for the first time. If people listening, hit up Queen Wartooth on Twitter. Check out and follow the Study NFT Dragon NFT Twitter account and go and mint your egg once that comes out sometime in June, I know I certainly will be. And hopefully I get really cute dragon that I like. Otherwise, I might be hitting up some of you to maybe make a little trade. But yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate all the listeners for tuning in and for everybody's amazing questions. And we will be back again next week with another episode of Rehash. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Rehash. 
Rehash is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Diana Chen. Rehash is also supported by our community of NFT holders who curate our guest lineup each season. To get involved, head over to our website at rehashweb3.xyz and collect this episode as an NFT. Anyone who collects an episode becomes part of the Rehash community and will be able to nominate guests for future seasons. To learn more about how to become a guest on the podcast, go to rehashweb3.xyz slash podcast. And to learn more about sponsoring the podcast, go to rehashweb3.xyz slash sponsor. Finally, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at RehashWeb3 or on Warpcast and Lens at Rehash and join our community on Telegram at t.me slash RehashWeb3. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.